My name is Bob Regan. I'm the president of the board of the Nashville Songwriters Association International, and I'm speaking to you today from uh, the Music Mill, the headquarters for the Nashville Songwriters Association. It's a group of songwriters basically founded in Nashville, but we've expanded pretty much across the country now. This is our headquarters, but we have workshops in probably 100 different cities across the country, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, one in almost every state. And we just provide services to songwriters. We can we have professional division. We have services for professionals. We do uh, extensive lobbying in Washington, D.C. Um, we have workshops across the country where beginning writers can come stick their head in and learn a little bit a little bit about what it actually entails to be a songwriter. We have online workshops for the members. We have song camps, song symposiums, just a whole array of services for songwriters in any genre and any skill level. We, we were formed in about 1967, and uh, there were back then there were very few writers in town, probably less than 100, but I think we had almost 40 songwriters at that time. Chris Christopherson uh, was living here at the time, Mary Jo Wilkins, who wrote Long Black Veil, and uh, basically the songwriters got together to get the songwriters' names on albums. And at that point, they some labels did, some labels didn't. Uh, they would just be the name of the song. So they banded together to say, we would like to have our names on these albums as a matter of industry policy. And that was sort of, it, it sprung from that. Uh, we're a trade association, um, and I should be able to speak intelligently on the difference between a guild, a union, and a trade association, but um, that's, that's what we are. And we do, basically, we'll lobby for anything that has to do with the music business. We will just try to make songwriters' voices known. Probably the biggest thing that's been our, our biggest victory by far in, in our almost 40-year history, uh, and for this is for artists, and I mean, anybody who's ever written a song, we just changed the tax code. And if you think that's easy to do, I invite you to try it. Uh, we just passed last week, it's called the Songwriters Capital Gains Tax Equity Bill. And in a nutshell, it's very complicated, but uh, Heretofore, when songwriters sold their catalogs, which they might do once or twice in a lifetime if they're very successful, you were taxed at regular income rate for that. Whereas if a publisher, which who owns this exact same product, if they sell the catalog, they get capital gains. So we saw an inequity there, and about four years ago, we started researching and making trips to Washington, D.C., and talking to accountants and tax attorneys and seeing, is this doable? And... Over the course of the last four years, we made four to five hundred trips to Washington. I mean, in individual sit-down meetings, and we just got the thing passed uh, two weeks ago. It was signed into law. So songwriters now, when they sell their catalog, if they're lucky enough to have a catalog that uh, gains value and they sell it, uh, they will be taxed at capital gains rate, which is 15 percent. And in, in my case, for example, uh, I sold a catalog about six years ago when I was taxed 39 percent. So brutal. But we fixed it for the next generation. I hope I'm lucky enough to have another catalog to sell. Uh, but that's huge. And so we're really trying to get the word out. That's going to, people will know about it here in Nashville. But, uh, I mean, this affects hip-hop people, rap stars, rock and roll. I mean, there, there's an entire music community of, of artists and songwriters um, that we've just made their life a whole lot better and they have no idea. So we're, we're going to try to make sure we tell that story. That's probably the 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 real high end of the services we provide. We're also I don't know how how aware you are of what's going on in Congress, but there, especially in the digital age, there are constant issues coming up about you know a, a music subscri a subscription service, for example. Um, if you subscribe to Yahoo for eight dollars a month or however much it is this week, um, is that a performance or is that a mechanical? Well, it's neither. So there's a uh, a lot of negotiations ongoing right now to try to determine, number one, who's going to license that, those songs for those services, who's going to collect and distribute the revenues. And songwriters are, you know, our, our interests are, you know, it's incredibly vital to our livelihood mm -hmm. because I foresee subscription services being huge over the next five to ten years. And so we're just trying to make sure for the first time that songwriters pure songwriters have a seat at the table and can make our voice known. So for that reason alone, anybody who's ever wanted to 
Anyone who's making money in the business needs to get involved with us. Anybody who wants to make money in the biz, because you've, you've got to have somebody looking out for you when these decisions are made. We have a general membership and we have a pro membership. And there's different criteria for professional membership. Obviously, you need to make the majority of your living as a songwriter <clears throat> or a performing artist with your original material. And for general members, it's anyone with a, an interest to write songs, learn more about writing songs. Uh, we'd love to have anybody and everybody get involved. Yeah, the general membership is 150 a year. And for that, we have song critique services. Uh, you can send in a song every month through email, and we have professional songwriters that will evaluate your songs. Um, we have online workshops, uh, audio, video. You can click log on the internet and watch professional songwriters. We have seminars every week, our Thursday workshop. Um, we have a, we're getting a library of those where you can access those from our website. Um, just a lot of just tools for the beginning songwriter to learn exactly what what it really entails to be a professional songwriter. And even if you don't want to be a professional songwriter, how to make your songs the best they can be. If you just want to write a song for your kids or for your parents' 50th wedding anniversary, we can help you make it the best it can be. And if you decide that if you get the bug and want to continue on and, as a, and try to keep you know working your way up the ladder, we have things that can help every step of the way. Basically, we have corporate sponsors Pretty much everybody on Music Row sponsors us, ASCAP, BMI, all the PROs, most of the major labels, and most of the major publishing companies, and some individuals, a lot of Music Row businesses, uh, management companies, production companies, uh, agents, banks. So I don't know the actual breakdown, but I think we probably get maybe a third of our funding from membership dues and the rest. Uh, probably split in half with corporate sponsorships and events. <clears throat> we put on countless shows throughout the course of the year. We have, just for example, at the Nashville airport when you fly in on a couple days a week, we have songwriters out there entertaining people as they come in. Um, a lot of the Chamber of Commerce will call us on a lot of occasions and have songwriters go to corporate events uh, because this is Music City USA and that's something you don't get anywhere else and it's always a huge hit when they see these people sitting up and banging out these songs they've heard and just for them for just people to realize that there are songwriters behind the scene that are creating these songs that's a that's that's a great hook for a lot of corporations and for the chamber of commerce so we do um excuse me we do a lot of corporate things we get funding that way and also our song camps um our song symposium and again we do a legislative show is probably one a month to try to help our legislative benefit our legislative fund we are probably for just pure songwriters. There's also the Songwriters Guild. They have an office here. They represent, um, they do some education, but they also represent catalogs and heirs of some old copyrights, and they do actually income collection, which is something we don't do. Um, ASCAP and BMI, the Performing Rights Societies and CSAC, also have certain services where they will do seminars and educational events. Um, but we are probably the most intensive on the ground level of just pure songwriter services. So we are in the process of enacting a name change and it's kind of a dicey thing because we want to make sure that we don't lose our roots and this basically this organization sprung up organically out of Nashville um, but we feel like we are especially with our lobbying efforts we really are servicing and serving <clears throat> songwriters of every genre everywhere they just don't know it so uh, we are it's in our long-term plan to open up a <clears throat> small office in Los Angeles to reach out to some other songwriters organizations that are functioning in places like Austin Texas uh, and other songwriting communities that just don't have a focal point to you know for writers to coagulate around and we can just tell them what we're up to and and hopefully the, we're proud of the Nashville in our name but we represent songwriters everywhere and there is a name change coming down the road but we just we have to be careful doing that because once we do that we've uh, you know, sponsorships, there's a lot, a lot of considerations, but we're, we're doing it carefully and methodically. Basically, we have a, in, well, I, let me just, I'll, I'll be specific about a regional workshop that I'm involved in, and uh, say there's one in Reno, Nevada, for example. Um, there's a regional coordinator, and it's their job to kind of 
spread the word through a music store or through radio stations, however they can do that, to let people who are interested in songwriting know that there's a place to come. They'll have a meeting every probably once a month, and we have a program here called the Adopt-A-Shop program where each workshop has a professional songwriter who is a mentor for that workshop. Now, before I was the mentor for the Reno workshop before I took on the presidency. I had to let it go. But so that, that's, that's how those work. They have a series of, we have a programs for you know, helping people critique songs, move their songs along, different things about lyric, melody, and we'll try to send the Adopt-A-Shop Pro out there to that workshop, you know, on a, a relatively regular basis if possible, and uh, just so that writers out in places like Reno or Des Moines can actually have a chance to talk to somebody who's involved in the business and can really answer their questions and help them get their game up, mm -hmm. which is difficult to do if you're not here. Mm -hmm. And we're with technology being what it is, we can. We're hoping to do video conferences and be able to make it all, you know, the interactivity a much a much better value. Because to this point, it's, you know, if I happen to get to Reno, I'll try to book it at a time when the workshop is meeting and go talk to them and uh, dispense a little wisdom, what little I have. So that's pretty much how the workshops work, <clears throat> and um, it's been a successful. We, I think we've had it 14 or 15 years. Uh, the workshops are also really valuable politically because politics is regional and sometimes we might have a, an important member on a committee that's dealing with an issue for songwriters and we don't. I, I'm personally from Northern California originally, and but if it's a, you know, for example, Congressman Grassley is the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and they had to sign off on our capital gains bill and he's from Iowa. So we have to scramble and go through our member base and say, well, we have a workshop in, uh, you know, Des Moines, and we have to, you know, try to get somebody from there to come and, and meet with the congressman or to at least write letters from their home district. So uh, the political end of things is very important for the workshops too, that we have representation all across the country. Ready to pitch. We are not a song plugging service. <clears throat> we absolutely don't want to get into that business but between a combination of all the songs that get sent in and our song critique service if something is really great and ready to be pitched we'll combine that along with the best of the best from the song contest and also the best of the best songs that might have turned up through our song camps and we'll put those on a cd and we have <clears throat> people from all the major publishing companies over a couple times a year feed them lunch play them the songs and give them a copy and we've had you know, a handful of songs cut from doing that. But uh, again, I would, it's, that's not a service we're going to say if people say, well, I want to join NSAI so you'll get my song recorded. That's, you know, th there is a, a, a slow percolating process by which that happens occasionally, but I would not say that's a reason to join NSAI. <clears throat> we can just help you hopefully get your song the best it can be. We got a huge, uh, uh, inventory of great books, you know, tell you everything, you know, just the music business in general, all kinds of, and I, I should be better versed in what's actually there than, than uh, what isn't there, but any resource a songwriter could want, go on the online bookstore and take a look at it, and I won't, I won't recommend any one book over the other, but I know there are some books in there that I personally read myself. Um, so that's just, you know, one more array of resources that we have available. That's our Thursday night workshop. Um, we set it up here. We got a camera. We were just, uh, it had been strictly a webcast. Now it's audio and video um, as of a couple of weeks ago. And so we'll bring in, a, I've done it myself. We'll bring in our, all our local membership comes. We'll fill up this building here uh, with maybe 50 or 60 people. And then however many people log in from online, you can send in questions. Um, and we're just kind of getting the bugs worked out of that, but we are up and running. That's if you're a member, you have our Thursday night workshops. <clears throat> and you can just check in. We have one of our um, David Rivers moderates and asks questions and takes questions coming in from the Internet. Right. So the whole thing is us trying to just make people feel connected. And thankfully the technology is getting better and better with each passing year, more and more, and more affordable. That's a personal decision, one which I tortured myself before moving out here even 20 years ago. Uh, it's every, obviously, the majority of the market in Nashville is 
for country songs. There are pop writers out here. There are, <clears throat> you know, bands, the Kings of Leon, a kid named Matt Morris, who's in our book, who's written songs for everybody from Justin Timberlake to Britney Spears, and he lives here. Um, it can be done. Uh, people need to, if you're serious about it, book a trip and come out and see what you, you know, just take a long weekend or a week and sort of come and get a feel for the town and see if it, uh, you think it's a good fit. The beautiful thing about Nashville is there's just a great creative community and the size of the town makes it such that people interact and, and there's a lot of songwriter clubs, open mic nights, so so people are constantly intermingling with each other and I know in other, in other places, probably even, even in other music centers, it can feel like you're fragmented and, um, and you know, apart from those of your kind, whether well, that's Nashville by the virtue of Music Row, 16th and 17th, for those that don't know, with every major record label and publisher right here on, on two little streets, <clears throat> it just creates a great kind of melting pot of, you know, of styles and, and artists, performers, people in every aspect of the business. So there's just a great community. I, I don't consider myself an artist at this point. I, I was an artist at one point, but I realized that there was more of a market for my songs than there was for me as an artist, so at that point I took one step back. Um, as far as me being involved in the sort of, you know, again, the, the industry side as opposed to being a pure songwriter, that was just a personal choice for me. I think it, it can be done. I wasn't ready to do it until I'd been writing songs every day for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> And I thought, well, let's try to do something else. And the opportunity to serve uh, the, as the NSAI president came up, and I tortured myself about doing that, whether I wanted to get involved. <clears throat> and it's, I'm really glad I did it. But I, you know, there's a general wisdom around Nashville. Is it's, it's hard to get songwriters. They tend to be not terribly businesslike or organized. And that's the same in any genre in any city. They call it herding cats and stacking jello to try to get songwriters to do anything. Uh, but that's a lot of writers really do have a great business sense. And, you know, I, I feel like for those of us who do have a little bit of a brain for that, we owe it to everybody else in the profession to take a little bit of time and try to accomplish a little bit of something. And for me, this is, I'm getting ready, I've been the president for three years and I'm getting ready to phase out. So I just kind of looked at this. This was my time in the barrel. And if I can move the ball forward a little bit, pass it on to the next guy. And, you know, and, and a, a lot of songwriters really have stepped up here in Nashville just because of this organization and, and giving people a framework. A lot of people say, well, I'd love to help. What do I do? So we say, here's what you do. You know, come to Washington, D.C. with us. Uh, you know, help us teach a workshop for NSAI, become an adopt shop member, you know, mentor for one of the workshops out in the country, and help us keep this groundswell moving and keep accomplishing things. So, yeah, it's, songwriters are, you know, a lot of, not terribly businesslike, but a lot of them are, and it's, uh, I feel like it's kind of our job in NSAI to make, make it easy for people to make the right decisions about the the big picture and their personal picture. We're trying to get that word out. A lot of people don't know, and it's fairly complicated. But in a nutshell, um, after 35, according to when the Copyright Act was redone in 1978, basically, when you assign a copyright, you assign it for 35 years, and then it reverts back to you. And I'm not much at math, but I think that's 2013 is the first year when these copyrights will start reverting. So. There's an awful lot of songs that were signed to publishers, and those songs will come back to the songwriter. And we need to get that word out as, as best we can. Um, we were just talking this morning, we had a little meeting, and Eddie Schwartz, who wrote Hit Me With Your Best Shot, and I can assure you that anybody with a song that big or even a quarter that big would love nothing more than to get it back in uh, five years from now. Uh, and that's what's going to happen, but there are certain very specific things that songwriters need to do to get these copyrights back if they have been assigned to a major publisher. Um, anything pre-78, there's a different set of rules. I think it's might be 50 years. Um, but again, some songs will be, 2013 is the first year that these copyrights will be coming back. So if anybody's watching this that has a song that they feel like might fall into this, again, it would have to be a song that obviously generated money in order for you to worry about it. And number two, a song that was signed to a publishing company where you signed away your publishing rights. 
they will come back, but there's a five-year window <clears throat> that starts in 2007 where you have to notify the publisher of your intent to recapture. So there are certain steps that need to be taken, and uh, again, we, we, that's one thing we're really trying to get that information out because I would hate for somebody to have a very valuable copyright or a standard that's generating a lot of money, let that five-year window go by, and in 2015 go, what happened? You mean I could have had the shadow of your smile back and I didn't? So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. The question was, you know, what, what advice would I give to somebody that wanted to become a songwriter? Uh, you, you just have to love the process of writing songs, for starters. If you're only going to want to do this because you want to sleep late and make a lot of money, you're, you know, it might happen, but the chances are it won't. So you have to just love songs and songwriting. And then you need to take a hard look at your stuff in relation to the market because this is the music business. And there's a big difference between sitting around on your guitar and doodling and, and thinking that sounds kind of nice and actually getting up to speed and competing at the highest levels with what's really working and making it on, on hit albums and on the radio. So you have to have a combination of, uh, I think Tom Schuyler, one of our former presidents, said you need the soul of a dove and the skin of a rhinoceros. Uh, because there's a lot of rejection. It's the greatest gig in the world, but you have to have an appetite for rejection and you, and you have to have a great work ethic. I know a few geniuses who come through and, and exert very little effort and, and are, have great success, but almost to a man, the people I know that have been around here and have been successful are up early every morning and working it and constantly trying to improve their craft, constantly keep learning and staying abreast of the newest trends this it's you know this is the music business so yet you have to approach it that way and it's a it's the constant balance of trying to be creative and trying to be business like to actually make a living at this absolutely best thing i ever did my plan b was to go to law school after my artist deal flamed out in la i was studying for the lsat half the day and writing songs for the other half and torturing myself and i had come to Nashville a few times and was well received and I was just oh god what do I what do I do what do I do so I finally said well if I don't try it I'll kick myself for the rest of my life so I said I'll, I'll give it three years so that was in 1985 what year is it now I forgot <clears throat> uh, but yeah it's been a, a great thing for me and and you know just it's a, a great town, a great way to make a living. And even if you don't make a living at it, songwriting is a cathartic, wonderful thing to do. You know, even if, even if the only thing you ever do is, like I said before, write a song for your kid's kindergarten graduation. I've, I write songs. My daughter just graduated from college. I wrote a song for her that, I, that nobody will ever hear. But that's part of the joy of being able to do this, to take an, you know, an emotion and, and to put it to music. So I think there's an immense value in that, whether you ever have a song recorded by anybody else or not. There's a, there's a great value to doing that. So anybody who's remotely interested in it, I encourage you to get involved.